This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, so, um, yeah, Sarah sent me the response, so I'm just, I'll just read that. Um, so I think, yeah, it's about ten minutes. Um, so she says... Thank you very much to both speakers for such interesting and thoughtful papers. In the next 10 minutes or so, I just wanted to draw out some of the overlapping themes in the papers and discuss how both papers fit within current disciplinary thinking in disability studies. I should hold my hand up now and say my background is sociology and I have little knowledge of humanities and literature. So, two very different papers about motherhood and disability. One based on empirical research in the UK, the other an analysis of a novel based in Spain. Chrissy's paper focuses largely on the care work involved in mothering a disabled child, in particular the emotional, practical and socio-political dimensions to care work. Abigail's paper focuses on mother blame and guilt and sets out to explore whether these are constants in our cultural conceptualization of motherhood. She questions whether the changes in models we see in the novel are cosmetic rather than actually meaningfully repositioning mothers in society. Okay, so she's got a section here called Fact or Fiction. When I was sent the two papers, I was intrigued as to how to respond to a work of fact and a work of fiction. My instinct was that the two are epistemologically different. One is made up, the other an outcome of a set of rigorous systematic procedures in generating and analysing real people's experience. I then got to wondering how different they were, or if the different genesis of both papers mattered. I noticed Ana Garcia Senoris had written a manual about childbirth, so straddling the divide between fiction and non-fiction. There are some academics who have written fiction, partly as an outlet through which they are able to express themselves more creatively. Academic convention can be stifling. For example, sociologist Hannah Bradby, who wrote a book called Skinful, based on her ethnographic study, said, quote, rather than withdrawing from peer review altogether, Here's an alternative antidote to excessive rejection, writing research as fiction. I have written a fictionalised representation of the subjects of an ethnography of Punjabis in Glasgow. The story is more entertaining, has better jokes, and arrives at a tidier end than my doctoral thesis, but is recognisably about the same world. And although I'm making up its truth, the fiction has, in some ways, been truer than the carefully reviewed, referenced and rewritten academic papers." End quote. Um, is Garcia Senoris's oh, Sin- novel um, with a made-up world any less true than Chrissy's work, which involves real people? These are interesting reflections which we can possibly return to in the discussion. Brackets. I say possibly because this may be something that is discussed all the time in literature studies. <laughs> okay, so the next section is the mother and the mothering relationship. A fascination remains with the mother-child relationship in social science research on disability as the experiences of mothers and disabled children are often enmeshed within the literature. While there are risks involved in focusing on mothers, reconfirming the myth of motherhood by suggesting that mothers, not fathers, are natural caregivers, I subscribe to the view that, given the history of mothering that is most frequently presented, mothers themselves need a space to write back in the research process in order to change existing colonising, medicalising and pathologising tendencies. Whether in either of these papers the mothers are really given the space to write back is questionable, but fathers are either relegated in Abigail paper or not present in Chrissy's. The maternal disadvantage and psycho-emotional disabilism mothers of disabled children experience led Greenspan to argue that it is fundamentally it is a fundamentally different experience to mothering non-disabled children and that this difference should be acknowledged. Catherine Runswick Cole and I wrote about how different it is to articulate these differences without confirming the views of others that to have a disabled child is a terrible thing, a view that we both wanted to challenge. And yet, despite our conversations with other mothers of disabled children and our own feelings, 
times of isolation and difference, we are beginning to question Greenspan's bold claim. We wonder if the biggest challenge mother, mothers of disabled children face is shared with many other mothers, the non-standard mothers that are the focus of this workshop. That is their child's and their own failure to conform in a culture held to ransom by the tyranny of the norm. In England, policy for children is premised on notions of an idealised, normal child, and many children fall outside the norm. Abigail highlights how medical developments and the scientific discourse which replaced religion, or as she points out, runs in tandem with religious discourse in earlier periods in secular society, has enabled the clear and arguably ambi unambiguous identification of abnormality through genetic testing. Tracy's narrative that Chrissy presents in her paper reminds us, I don't know how much we went into that, but reminds us how medicine is less certain or even relevant in the case of learning disability. Brad falls out the no outside the norm and is accordingly punished through the responses of other parents because his behaviours tran transgress social norms and values. Is that the first boy you were talking about? Yeah, that, I didn't get oh, okay. that um, So the next section is a constant burden, question mark. One of the research questions for today's workshop was, in what ways do what we are calling non-standard mothers and mothering offer positive models of motherhood? To provide a brief social science context, up until the 1990s, the dominant theme in research on parenting disabled children was the burden and stress this type of parenting involves. This cross-disciplinary work emphasises a tragedy model of disability with parents, in particular mothers, experiencing a sense of bereavement of not getting the child they anticipated, hoped for or thought they had. Subsequently, there has been a welcome shift in focus onto positive experiences in parallel with the development of disability studies and shifting understandings of disability and difference. The problem has shifted from being one located within the disabled child or adult to one caused by the lack of appropriate support and services and this is a social model approach. Research began to focus more on how parents adapted, adjusted, made sense of their family lives. There was talk of a new normal. Parents and family members created a context that incorporated the different dimensions of their family life and how these worked for them. Interestingly, much of the enlightened literature is written by mothers of disabled children. These positive accounts may have been needed to facilitate a shift in thinking and to establish a credible foundation for examining the experiences of parenting a disabled child outside of the tragedy model. However, just as the wider British disability studies have been debating the place of impairment, this debate is also taking place among mother researchers. For example, Green concluded that the experience is more emotionally complex than she previously considered. The analyses in both papers today engage with the challenges and negativity involved in having a disabled child. Chrissy raises the point that the social model falls short of addressing objective difficulties and emotional responses around impairments. She talks about the tension experienced by mothers who want to conform to dominant norms around being a good mother whilst needing to accept public support through necessity. Chrissy argues convincingly that we need to change the value of care and promote greater interdependence. I would add to this that we need to challenge dominant norms of what a good mother is, to shake off the guilt mothers feel about accepting support in what are sometimes quite extreme circumstances. Paradoxically, it can sometimes be impossible to be a good mother, as opposed to a good mother, without ac accessing support. This is illustrated by the examples Chrissy provides of the mothers who killed their children. Let's imagine. <laughs> yeah, I left that out. It's, it's, sounds, tragic. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting stuff. Yeah, maybe. It is in the paper, but. Yeah, maybe you can refer to it in a minute. Um, the emotional responses of the children, of the mothers towards their children. None of my mothers killed their children, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the emotional responses of the mothers towards their children, their care work and their life situations, more generally in Chrissy's research, involve the blame, shame and guilt that Abigail's paper focuses on. Maria's interpretation of her daughter is framed within a medical model of disability. Alma has an identifiable genetic anomaly. The problem is undeniably located within Alma and this is intertwined with her mother's biology and Maria's mother before that. The medical diagnosis of diamond black phantom, 
anemia is an unshakable, unchallengeable thing which is already there. It just takes a medical consultant to identify it. Once identified, Maria and Fernando focus their attention on the condition. This relates to the recent turn to impairments within disability studies, led perhaps by Tom Shakespeare. He, he insists that impairment is a predicament and can be tragic. He argues that some impairments are static, others episodic, some degenerative and others terminal, but all impairments are a manifestation of biological limitation. Quote. Oh, oh no. Sorry, wrong page. Analyses of disability and abnormality must therefore take seriously the experiential realities of impaired bodies. Maria and Fernando take their daughter's medically impaired body seriously, take, seeking the best medical advice and treatment available. Alma, the child, is not really present within the paper, unlike Maria and Carmela, who are thinking, emotional, acting characters. This is in contrast to Bray Dotty, who argues that the body is neither a biological nor a sociological category, but an interface, a threshold, a field of, field of intersecting material and symbolic forces, a surface where multiple codes, sex, class, age, race, and the obvious, etc., are inscribed. Simply, disabled children's bodies cannot exist outside of culture and bodies reveal much about deeply held cultural discourses around disability. Finally, I just wanted to highlight the clear differences in emphasis between the two papers. Abigail draws on the shift from a religious to medical discourse to frame her paper. Chrissy's paper focuses more on care work, support or the lack of support, and the effects of experiencing the punitive, lay and professional, gaze of others. She poignantly draws out how Tracy remains uncared for, while at the same time expected to do extreme caring in challenging circumstances. Perhaps coming back to earlier discussion around fiction and non-fiction, qualitative research, when done well, opens up and makes visible the complexity and messiness of what is involved in mothering a disabled child at a particular time in a particular space. Fiction, while also drawing and incorporating layers of complexity, is, or has the space to be, tidier. <laughs>